Hey kiddos. All right. Um, today we are going to read chapter two of our new book, My Survival, A Girl on Schindler's List. If you are on track with us, then today is Thursday, April 16th. I'm going to go into my classroom, into our drive, and open up our presentation, which you guys are welcome to go in and open up and look through at any time as we read through our book. Um, I did post a chapter one quiz. It was really short, simple, um, if you guys wanted to go in and take that. What I'm going to do is recap all of our chapters and any responses I asked for you to respond to in the beginning of the following week to give you guys just a little bit of time to work through those. So what we're going to do today, um, we're again going to look at a focus standard and it's going to be different from our standard from chapter one. In chapter one, we focused on main idea um, because this is a memoir and an informational text. We're using informational standards. So today we're going to focus on something a little bit different. So I have my Google Slides presentation right here, and I'm going to go ahead and go into present mode so that you guys can clearly see our presentation. Okay. Like I said, if you're on track with me, today's Thursday, April 16th. If not, totally fine. You're still on day two of our book. And we're going to read Chapter 2, 1930s, Another World. So our focus standard for today is right here, RI 4.5. Now, let's review what these letters and numbers stand for. We have RI, which stands for Reading Informational. And then we have our 4.5. Our 4 is our grade level. So right now we're focusing on fourth grade because that's where most of our readers are. I know I have some fifth grade students following along here. And guess what? Your standard for fifth grade, RI 5.5, is very, very similar. So don't worry about that. And then 5, this is just the fifth standard when we list out informational standards. So like I said, your standards especially in third fourth and fifth grade your standards are really close to each other so um, when we look at a standard all of this all of the fifth standards on your grade level is going to be about the same topic the same skill okay so it's definitely still meaningful for a fifth grader to apply a fourth grade standard because it's very similar to your fifth grade standard if that makes sense all right, so our I can statement for today is I can describe the structure of a text and explain how different parts of a text are connected. All right, here's on. I can describe the structure of a text and explain how different parts of a text are connected. Mirrors off. Okay, so let's talk about some of these things. When we describe, we're just telling about something, right? Um, what is the structure of a text? What does that mean? If I ask you for the structure of a text, think in your head for a minute, what does that really mean when I'm asking you about structure? And when we talk about how different parts of a text are connected, what does that mean? All right, let's take a look. Okay. Text structure. Structure refers to how something is built or how information is organized. So we're looking for the relationship between the paragraphs and the ideas that are presented in the text. We have five major text structures that we look at. Description, where something is being described. You're telling all of the details about something. Sequence. First, next, then, last, before, after. Tell something in order. Often, that's going to be where you find a historical text. Comparing and contrasting. When we tell how two things are alike and how they're different. Cause and effect. When we tell how something causes something else to happen. And then problem and solution presents a problem and how to fix that problem. So those are our informational text structures that we mostly look at. For a second, I want to step back into literature and talk about the literature text structure, which we can talk about. We can talk about the structure of a literature text, but it's a little bit different because all literature is organized in a sequence. So we're not going to see that kind of difference. 
When we talk about structure in literature, we talk about poetry, drama, and prose. That's our difference. When we talk about poems, plays, and stories, that's what we mean when we talk about structure. We talk about how it's organized into paragraphs, or sentences, or scenes, or lines, or stanzas, right? But in an informational text, we're really looking closely at the ideas and how those ideas are organized, how the author presents those ideas to us. And just because something is historical doesn't mean it's going to be presented in a sequence. It really is the author's decision to present that however they feel will meet their purpose, right? So if I'm describing, I could describe one event in history and it could not have a sequence at all because it all happens at the same time and then I'm just giving my descriptions. Or I could tell one major cause and one major effect of that piece of history. Or I could compare that piece of history to another event in history. So it really is up to the author. You'll never look at something and know right away. It's another d interesting difference between when we talk about the structure of a literature text and the structure of an informational text. Literature, we can look at that and we know the structure. We don't even have to read it. We flip through something and we go, yep, this is a play. Or we look at it, yep, that's a poem. You can't do that with informational. You have to actually read it because you have to figure yeah. out how the author organized that information and how they're presenting it to you. Make sense? So we're going to look at the structure of this text and we're going to look at how the chapters are presented and how they're connected and how that information is organized and given to us. Okay. Alright, so we're going to read through chapter two. Um, I want you to think as we read, how does the author organize the chapters? And the information in this chapter specifically, how is that organized? And in life, oh, our, um, our quote, right? Remember I told you I was going to pick out a quote that is really, really meaningful. So our quote from this chapter, I love. In life, not everybody is going to like you. And you're not going to like everyone either. But that's no reason to hate them. Okay. So in here, um, I'm going to try to give you guys a couple of visuals because I know that you're, you're not quite as familiar with this content. So I want to take a look for a second. This is Adolf Hitler. He was that leader of Nazi Germany. So this is just his picture. And right here, that's the symbol of Nazi Germany. And that was called a swastika. Um, and it became a symbol of hatred really. And then over here we have just a little bit of information about the religion of Judaism. We don't, it's not as large of a religion down here in New Orleans so you guys might not have as much exposure to it. Um, but Judaism is a really similar to religion, religion to the religions that you guys probably do know. They believe in one God um, who's a creator and they pray to him. Um, they have a prophet who was Moses, was their kind of main prophet. Um, they have what is called a Torah, which is a law from God. You guys might have seen it in maybe movies or TV shows where they open up this big scroll and they read from it in another language. Um, they talk about the coming of a Messiah. They reward good, they punish bad, and they have a specific type of food called kosher food, which is what they eat. So. That's really it. I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of background on Judaism. It's not that important that you understand it. It's just that you understand that it's slightly, and I mean it's really only slightly different from Christianity. Okay, so keep that in mind. And now we're going to read. I hope this works well for you guys where I pop up this other screen to read from. Because it just makes it a little bit bigger. It's just another app where I read from. Anyway, okay. All right, so we are going to read through chapter two of My Survival, My Survival, A Girl on Schindler's List. I have to remember to stop myself of calling out page numbers for you guys because the page numbers probably don't mean anything because I know most of you guys are reading electronically. So um, if I say a page number, just ignore it and I'll try to locate you around a certain part of a chapter, if that makes sense. Okay. 
here we go. Remember that we're looking for the structure. How are the ideas organized? All right. 1930s, another world. To understand the story you are about to read, it will help to know something about my childhood and where I came from. Please keep in mind that today I am 90 years old. These are the memories of a girl in her early teens, and some memories change over time. I cannot promise you that everything happened exactly as I am recalling. After so many years, some details may be less than perfect. What I can promise you is that everything I tell you is truthful, and that these things did happen. I was born in 1929 in Kraków, Poland, in Kraków, Poland's historical capital city. Kraków was the center of the nation's artistic and cultural life. It had a famous university attended by students from around the world. Electric streetcars crisscrossed the city, bringing people to offices, museums, and libraries. I lived with my mother, Rosa, and my father, Moses, in one of Kraków's many apartment buildings. Our building was a few blocks from the center of the city and next door to a Franciscan monastery. There was a balcony off the stairway landing below our fourth floor apartment. From the balcony, I could look into the monastery's backyard where there were fruit trees and flowering bushes. In the early morning hours, monks walked slowly around the backyard in their long brown robes, praying on strands of wooden beads. My memories of early childhood are, for the most part, like that orchard calm and pleasant. My parents' bedroom had a large wooden clothes closet. In the kitchen was an iron cook stove that burned coal. A Polish woman came once a week to clean and on cold days she took a metal bucket, walked down four flights of marble stairs to the cellar, filled the bucket with coal and carried it back upstairs. Heat from three coal-burning ovens warmed the whole apartment. I remember other details from my childhood. Our main language at home was Polish, but my mother hired a tutor who taught me German. Because of all the later horrors that happened to me and my family at the hands of Nazi Germany, once I came to America, I never wanted to hear German spoken ever again. Okay, think for a second how the information in just that beginning part was organized. Was it organized in description, through sequence, through comparing and contrasting, cause and effect, problem and solution? Think about it. Okay. My father was a good man, loving, attentive to me and my mother, and always looking to do good for others. He earned a living as a salesman for a company that made surgical instruments and hospital supplies. He left Krakow every Monday morning by train to visit out-of-town customers and returned on Friday in time for the start of the Sabbath. The Sabbath, the time between sunset on Friday and sunset on Saturday, has always been the most sacred part of the week for Jews. During those 24 hours, religious Jews dedicate their time to religious study and do no work. Even turning on a light switch is considered work and forbidden on the Sabbath. I was an only child, but my mother had six siblings and my father had seven. My mother's parents, Hannah and Isaac, had their own apartment around the corner from us. I had cousins who lived on the other side of the Vistula River, which flowed around the city. And my mother's siblings lived in Berlin, Germany, about eight hours away by train. So as a child, I was surrounded by family. In summer, we all came together and rented a cottage in the village called Zawoja, near a famous mountain known as Baba Gura, Baba Mountain, where we hiked, swam in freshwater streams, and picked juicy strawberries and wild mushrooms. There was an elderly woman who took care of us on summer days while my parents, aunts, and uncles went hiking up Baba Mountain. One time when the grown-ups were out mountain climbing, the sky grew dark, a heavy rainstorm began, and thunder shook the windows. We kids weren't so scared, but the nanny was terrified and insisted we all kneel down and pray. It felt funny. What did a bunch of Jewish kids know about Christian prayers? But we did it anyway to make her happy. These days, 
when I'm invited to speak about my childhood, students often asked if I experienced anti-Semitism. Yes, I did. Many of our neighbors didn't bother hiding their hatred of Jews. Of course, each person who endured the Holocaust has particular memories and conditions were different depending on where people grew up and how they were treated. In my case, growing up in Krakow, the anti-Semitism was obvious. You could see it in people's faces when they looked at you. Sometimes they did worse than just look, as I found out when I was six years old and starting school. Krakow had a large Jewish population. About 60,000 of the city's 200,000 residents were Jews. There was a private Jewish girls' school, but it was a few miles away from our building, and my parents didn't like the idea of me walking such a long distance alone. Instead, they sent me to a public school around the corner from our house. The school was so close that my mother could stand on the balcony of our apartment and watch me playing in the schoolyard to be sure I was safe. My first day in kindergarten, a few of us five and six-year-olds were playing hopscotch in the schoolyard. Without warning, one of the girls picked up a stone and threw it at me. Go home, you dirty Jew, she yelled. Did I hear her right? I was too shocked to say anything. That afternoon when school ended, I ran home and told my mother what had happened. Why did that girl call me dirty? I asked. I'm not dirty. I took a shower just this morning. My mother told me some people called us dirty just because our religion was different from theirs, and they didn't like us. That made no sense to me. But as a six-year-old, what did I understand of the world? I loved everybody and was happy playing with the other girls in my school. Who cared which religion they belonged to? The next day, my mother took me by the hand and we walked to the local library where she looked for a book that might explain anti-Semitism. I don't remember if she found such a book, but I do remember her telling me, in life, not everybody is going to like you and you're not going to like everyone either. That's no reason to hate them. My mother and father were friendly with the Polish woman who was superintendent of our building. She had three sons. My parents helped her sons find jobs, and out of appreciation, she invited us to join them for their Christmas holiday dinner. Still, that kind of friendship between Jews and non-Jews was rare. Our family went back many generations in Poland, and my parents were strongly patriotic. We loved our country. My mother's oldest brother, Zygmunt, had been a surgeon for the Polish army during the First World War. When he was killed on the battlefield, the army awarded him one of its most prestigious medals. I used to take Uncle Zygmunt's medal to school for show and tell, but having an uncle who was a war hero didn't matter to kids whose parents had taught them to hate Jews. And the Jewish students always had to be on the lookout for stone throwers. Sometime in the spring of 1938, when I was nine years old, my Aunt Helen and my Uncle Benjamin and their two children, Rita and Jenny, visited us from Berlin. In the evening, the grown-ups waited until they thought the children were asleep and then whispered about Adolf Hitler. Germany's dictator, and the terrible things his Nazi party was doing to Jews. My aunt and uncle said they were afraid the Nazis would force them to give up their tailoring business and send them to a concentration camp. I had no idea what that meant. What was a concentration camp? Could any of this be true? It was so frightening. I didn't sleep that night. Okay, take a second to look at the titles of the chapters. See if you can figure out how the author organizes the details in this book overall. And then think specifically about this chapter, because I think that this chapter is a little bit different. So we haven't really gotten into her story yet. She's still kind of giving us some background information. So I want you to think about how the ideas in this chapter, specifically in chapter two, were organized as well. Okay? And one more time, just for fun, let's reread our quote, because I really like this quote. 
in life, not everybody is going to like you. And you're not going to like everyone either. But that's no reason to hate them. An important quote. All right, kiddos. Um, see you soon for chapter three. Love you, miss you, mean it.